great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. So thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me and thank you all for coming to my talk. So um, yeah, as uh, Anna said, I'm Irini Papa Theodoru and I'm the Gene Expression Team Leader at uh, Emboli BI. Um, and uh, just to give you uh, a little idea of how this talk is going to go. So first, um, I'm going to talk about the um, the expression resources that my team develops. So my team is a, a role is really twofold. It's to deliver the services of Expression Atlas and single cell Expression Atlas on one hand, and on the other hand, to do research and investigate uh, really how can we use this data to link uh, um, to establish a link between gene expression and phenotype. And we do that in two different ways. So we're looking at human disease and the cell type composition in human disease cohorts and develop methods uh, and benchmark methods for this purpose. And also uh, compare cell types and integrate them across different species. So basically my talk is gonna go from the resources to the two different uses and uh, describe a little bit our results on those two. So, um, so yeah, so starting, uh, so as I said, I'm from the ABI and uh, I'm, I'm sure most people know that ABI delivers lots of different uh, data resources from like um, chemistry to genes, genomes and RNA, proteins, imaging uh, and so on. And uh, my team delivers the expression atlas, which um, sits uh, somewhere here in the genes and uh, genomes and RNA. And uh, what is uh, our mission? Basically, what is the Expression Atlas? So the Expression Atlas is an added value bioinformatics resource um, that is for um, gene and protein expression. And our mission there is to provide to the scientific community free and available information on the abundance and localization of protein and RNA across different species um, and biological conditions. And we, with this endeavor, we aim to enable researchers to answer key questions such as where and under which conditions a gene or a protein of their interest is expressed. So, um, so here you have a link to the uh, expression atlas to look at it directly. And it's really split into two resources. So one deals with the bulk data. So it contains uh, data from, uh, that's the major expression atlas, contains data from 65 different species. And it has currently over 4,000 bulk data sets. Um, about 90 of them come from proteomics techniques, so mass spec. The rest are RNA-seq and there are some microarrays there as well. And then uh, around 340 describe baseline expression, which is the constitutive expression uh, of genes uh, in tissues at healthy conditions, right? And then we also um, have a lot of uh, differential expression assays and experiments where there's a comparison between, for example, healthy and disease. Um, and then the single cell expression atlas, which is what I'm going to focus here, uh, is, the, is the newest uh, resource, that is the, um, the, the Expression Atlas for single cell RNA-seq data. And at the moment we have uh, in there data from 21 different species. Uh, these are around 355 single cell data sets and uh, they include um, about 10 million cells that have passed QC and so on. And you can read more on our latest uh, NAR databases update paper um, that is uh, here at the at the bottom, uh, and look more into the features. So, um, so I'm going to show you a few uh, examples of how the expression atlas, single cell expression atlas, can be used to find this information. Before I go into what we do to the data to bring it to the website for for usage. So. So basically, I will show you an example examples of how the Atlas effectively combines knowledge uh, across studies and makes them readily available. So users basically can conveniently search for analyzed data by some descriptive keywords from the web interface. So for example, one can search by a gene or a cell type, an organ, disease or condition, and so on um, by using the search. And you can specify species if you want to. 
So uh, in this example, I have queried uh, uh, one B gene in the main expression atlas, the bulk one. And first you see the results of uh, the baseline uh, analysis from transcriptomics and genomics. It's a heat map where on the top you see the different uh, tissues and here it's the different studies. And what one can see quite, uh, quite uh, easily is that um, it's, it's gene is expressed uh, consistently in experiments that have uh, tested pancreas um, in uh, transcriptomics, but also in the proteomics experiments as well. Then um, looking at the bulk uh, differential expression, where the studies, uh, the comparisons uh, are ranked according to the, uh, the fall change of the differential expression assays, uh, one can see that the studies that aggregate at the top uh, show down regulation of this gene, especially in studies that look into pancreatic cancer. So someone can get an idea where that uh, gene um, uh, might be up or down regulated, also looking at the metadata that are associated with each uh, study. And then they can delve deeper into each uh, study and even download the data and do further analysis. So um, what we see now, for example, by looking into the single cell expression atlas for the same gene, here is a selected study, it's the uh, pancreatic human pancreas, um, is that actually this gene is specifically expressed in uh, one particular cell type. And you, I'm looking, uh, you can see uh, here um, the cells uh, colored by cell type. I'm sorry that you cannot see what they are. Uh, and then here colored, the same graph colored by the uh, expression level of that gene. And what you can see is that it's expressed in pancreatic as in our cells uh, higher, uh, quite highly rather than in other cell types. So this kind of summarizes the value that we add to the studies by having them in the expression atlas. So further, we cater for other views for specific experiments, especially in collaboration with the human cell atlas. We started developing these um, uh, diagrammatic views of the human body um, and also relating these, um, um, uh, these views to the heat maps showing the marker genes per uh, region or cell type. Uh, as well. So here what one can see by looking at this specific region is that it contains several other cell types and also looking at the different marker genes that um, have um, emerged that have been uh, identified uh, in the study uh, per cell type. And um, we can also zoom in further and see if we have this image for these particular cells, what, what they, they look like in the diagram and so on. So um, I also said before that we don't necessarily need to search by gene, but we can also search by cell type. And uh, for example, here, if we search for glial cell um, in all sp species, uh, this will, will return a wheel as a summary of the search results from this keyword. Uh, and the along with the species and the organism parts of the organ and the cell types corresponding to the collections of studies. And the user could click on the species of interest, for example, here in Drosophila, and browse through the related cell types. And if we click on the cell type of interest, the data sets in which the cell type is present will be displayed. Uh, as well as the top kind of uh, genes of this cell type would also show uh, as a heat map in a, in a summarized view. So these are basically the two different data sets with uh, different um, genes that are highly scored. So their potential marker gene. And you can get a snapshot or you can go into each study and look separately as well. So, uh, so yeah, so how do we um, get to this integrated and standardized collection of knowledge? Um, so it is because our data go through a journey in the expression atlas. And uh, that really consists of three different parts. So first, um, 
I have there is a, we have a, a dedicated team of curators um, that collect the data and process them for from the data archives such as BioStudies, ENA, uh, and Geo, and so on. So we use a standardized curation and ontology annotation to make these studies comparable and searchable. Um, and then uh, the curated data go into a standardized data analysis pipeline that uh, is being developed and maintained um, by, by informaticians and software engineers in the team. So um, there these pipelines basically go from mapping to quantification, normalization, clustering and detection of marker genes uh, per experiment. And um, this process, is, is, we call it the data production. Uh, and finally, we develop uh, these combined uh, visualization tools and the web interface to enable this knowledge integration and the querying. Um, so just to highlight uh, a few of the, um, of the outcomes of, of kind of this endeavor to build this um, you know, data journey for single cell data uh, and make it in a production nice way. So to make this combination across studies possible in terms of data input, we were working very closely with the international single cell community. And we have been discuss we're discussing metadata standards uh, so that we all agree how to describe uh, the experiments in a reproducible way. Um, and, and therefore, we also developed these guidelines with the community um, where we identify the information that is required to ensure uh, reproducible analysis and inform uh, new uh, large scale projects that aim to collect this kind of data. So, um, in terms of the analysis pipeline, so here we use community derived tools. So uh, those of you who um, are working with single cell data will probably um, have used a lot of this. Um, we split the analysis into two parts. Um, the kind of um, the uh, primary analysis down to the cell by gene table with row counts and then the the kind of uh, secondary analysis that uh, involves the filtering, normalization, clustering, and so on. And, and here really, um, so basically we have, we use these community derived tools, pack them in workflow management software. And I would like to highlight that the pipeline is uh, production optimized, which means that it's very modular and it's adaptive. So it's easy to integrate new tools as we expand to new data sets from a new species, for example, and diversify uh, this uh, pipeline accordingly. So, and generally we comply with the engineering principles for scalable and reproducible analysis here. Um, so yeah, so that, that was really the first um, part of uh, my talk. So uh, with, that includes the, the kind of services that we deliver. So uh, now that I have introduced the services, I would like to describe two examples uh, where, uh, of using and integrating such data further. And now that we have them in a standardized format. And first I will uh, present our strategy for deriving cell type composition in bulk disease samples. And second, um, our efforts in looking at cell type similarities and differences across species. And our distant aim is that really these results of such analysis will one day be available through the Expression Atlas so that all users can benefit from them. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so both the resources, the bulk, the single cell RNA-seq, have collected large scale projects such as GDEX, DCGA on the bulk side. Um, we're collecting human cell atlas data, mouse cell atlas, fly cell atlas, and, and so on. And we continuously want to push the limits of this resource and integrate data in, in different ways. Um, so we have uh, identified these two types of comparisons um, in order to be able to uncover uh, further the link between phenotype, disease in humans, and also uh, the similarities and differences in uh, different species. 
So, so yeah, so just to start, so first the bulk expression atlas contains lots of data, that, especially large patient cohorts with information that could be further understood by combining them with the emerging single cell reference data from tissues coming from projects such as the Human Cell Atlas. And here we investigate um, how well, uh, how we could use uh, the techniques of cell type deconvolution and how well they perform in order to be able to give us proportions of uh, uh, the different cell types in the bulk data that we have um, in, uh, in the bulk expression atlas, which cover a wide variety of diseases and a lot more patients uh, and so on than um, they exist in the single cell uh, side. And um, so what we do, just to give a little bit of an introduction, we used the techniques of cell type deconvolution. So basically deconvolution approaches uh, try to fit a linear model to explain the observed expression um, of a gene in a bulk uh, sample uh, by building a weighted sum of cell type specific expression profiles uh, in a signature matrix uh, such, such as uh, this one. I, I find this visualization really nice um, to explain this. And, and this, um, this kind of um, matrix of um, expression profiles is, uh, is also relative uh, uh, to the fractions um, of the cell types in this uh, mixture. So uh, basically uh, what we do is uh, really to generate uh, suitable synthetic bulk data with uh, ground truth, provide guidance for selection of which deconvolution method to use. And also what we um, try to do is understand the features that affect the, the performance of deconvolution. So as the reference to use, the single cell reference that you're using, how, how we need to pre-process the data and um, how does the cell type uh, number in the reference um, affect how good that how well uh, the sample will be deconvolved on the bulk side? Um, and then we also want to, and we started actually um, I, deconvolving uh, tumor data as well as other um, disease data. Uh, to study the contribution of cell proportions in the disease phenotypes. So, so basically these are the goals of uh, um, this analysis. And uh, as I hinted before, there are a lot of different cell type deconvolution methods. I think there are around 50 uh, or something like that. And the, and the results uh, are quite variable actually, and really depend large, largely on the bulk data the methodology, um, the underlying methodology of these two, of each two, and uh, what references were used and how good they are, how close to the truth. Um, it's also very difficult generally to evaluate um, how well a cell type deconvolution technique works. And that is because in most real life scenarios, we don't really have ground truth to compare against the predictions of the cell type proportions. So in order to uh, investigate the performance, we, um, we designed a co comprehensive uh, benchmarking of uh, different uh, deconvolution, cell type deconvolution methods. And we used uh, about 41 single cell data sets. We leveraged them to construct a uh, ground truth with pseudobug. So this is um, uh, kind of outlined in this diagram. Uh, which you can also find on our preprint um, in, in an easy, easier to explain way. Uh, but basically what we did, um, we constructed ground truth by building pseudobug from uh, single cell data. And we built uh, these uh, different reference uh, matrices uh, that then we used for the deconvolution. So, so these um, uh, expression matrices, we process them by applying different transformation and normalization methods so that we can get an idea uh, of their performance um, as well and how the normalization, for example, affects uh, the end result of the deconvolution. 
and then we used uh, pseudo bulk profiles from uh, the single cell studies to um, uh, we deconvolve them by using 28 uh, different methods. And basically these methods were selected uh, on, on the basis of um, whether they were open source uh, and so on, well-maintained. So basically candidate methods for uh, using them more broadly in the future. Um, and then finally, we evaluated the results of the deconvolution. These are kind of uh, the different cell type portions uh, using two different uh, metrics such as R and RMSC, the root mean square er uh, error. And this pipeline, we call it a cat D. Everything is wrapped um, into, um, uh, into a flexible pipeline that uh, was built in SnakeMake. And you can easily add a new method if you want to check an extra method that the ones uh, that are there. Um, and uh, also we provide the visualizations that will enable you uh, to compare the performance of these methods on your data set as well. So, um, so yeah, so here I show three examples of assays we uh, explored uh, during uh, this uh, benchmarking. And basically we are looking here first uh, at the effect um, of, um, of uh, of sample in cell type deconvolution, looking, for example, at the effect of which reference we use to deconvolve a bulk sample, uh, where initially the bulk is a pseudo bulk deconvolved by the self reference, so the same single cell sample, uh, or then uh, by a different sample from the same study or by a completely different study. And uh, how big is that effect and which methods perform best uh, at that? Then we also explored. Um, the role that uh, the single cell technology plays uh, into how good the, um, the convolution is. And there we looked um, um, at placenta samples that are publicly available. They come from the same study. And one is with 10X, uh, was done with 10X, and the other one with SmartSig2 technology. And we assess, therefore, the performance of different deconvolution methods in the two uh, settings. And we do find that the highest uh, performing um, methods uh, generally um, deconvolve more cell types in the setting or when a 10x um, reference uh, is being used. And uh, finally, we looked at the same organ but different tissues of the same organ, the brain tissues, um, and looked into the performance of all the methods across the different sub tissues. Uh, using Pearson correlation and um, uh, RMSC across these uh, tissues. And again, we identified the few top performing uh, methods. So, um, so what we did is uh, generally the idea is that we take the consensus of the top methods and then we apply it to other data sets. And here is a, a data set that, um, uh, where we used uh, uh, um, PBMCs. So this is a published data set again uh, that includes ground truth of estimated uh, cell type proportions uh, from the bulk samples in the form of immunohistochemistry. So basically we have the uh, bulk um, and the immunohistochemistry data uh, from the same sample, we uh, do the deconvolution and we check how well the proportions that we infer fit with the proportions of cells from immunohistochemistry. And again, uh, we could see the, sim the same kind of top few methods performing uh, highly in this scenario as well. Um, so now, so that's the final example I'm going to show. We have actually started using it more widely into data sets from Expression Atlas, but also with collaborators. And here is in a solid tissue uh, with our collaborators, Evangelia Petzalaki, also from EBI, and Theodoris Kutsandreas. So we, um, we looked at uh, data in the context of uh, liver fibrosis, uh, where there have been, uh, we obtained samples uh, of a fibrotic and uh, healthy liver from uh, different uh, individuals. And here is uh, basically a workflow of the typical differential expression, uh, RNA, bulk RNA-seq um, 
uh, analysis uh, that basically gives you differential expression analysis and functional analysis as well. And what we hope is to also be able to do the convolution analysis to explore the changes of cell type proportions and elucidate the cell type specific expression uh, in the disease context. So basically what we want is really the convolution to help us explain further questions such as is uh, a gene A upregulated in the sample or is it in the population of cells that, uh, ec that express um, um, an increase in proportion, for example, um, and, or in which population of cells are upregulated and downregulated genes or pathways present. Um, so just uh, to show what we did first, the first task was to find a good reference for this. And we looked at the human cell atlas and the human liver uh, atlas. And in order to check how good this reference is, we built pseudobulk. We ran it through the pipeline, deconvolved it using the same reference. And so which methods perform best in uh, that setting and resolve the cell types uh, correctly. And then we applied this. Um, to uh, we applied the top methods that were DWLS, FARDIP, and EPIDES um, to the um, to the different patients that are uh, arranged uh, here um, on the graph from the liver fibrosis. Um, and what one can see, and these are the different cell types that have been predicted in the different uh, proportions on this side of the graph. And what, what we can see is um, that hepatocytes are a most abundant uh, population. We see a slight drop. We had a few patients at the end that were at a kind of final stage um, of the disease um, where this is expected, although we see only a tiny drop because there were only a few patients uh, that were in the later state of the disease. And then uh, the hepatocytes are followed by hepatic stellate and third most abundant cell type is endothelial cells that are annotated central venous uh, LSECs. Um, and uh, non-inflammatory macrophages on the left and Kupfer on the right coming forth. And the rest of the cell types uh, here really at the bottom are almost undetectable, like the neutrophils and so on. They have very uh, tiny proportions. So, um, so yeah, so that's uh, where we are with this. This is an ongoing um, uh, project. So uh, basically we have, um, we have uh, found a consensus of top performing methods. Um, that are working across the data sets, uh, selected data sets of Expression Atlas. What we're doing now is um, really trying a new, uh, more um, disease settings in order to be, <coughs> excuse me, um, in order to confirm that uh, the method is working. And, um, and then also compute and report cell type abundances of the available bulk experiments in Expression Atlas. And we hope with this, in this way, with computational deconvolution, to bridge uh, the data in Expression Atlas with the uh, reference data in the single cell Expression Atlas and enable uh, users to gain more information from the bulk side. And uh, we are also working uh, with other collaborators to see how this resource of the convolved uh, cell types can uh, inform differential expression and in QTL analysis, but also how we can enhance these results by network analysis. Um, so yeah, so, so now uh, I can move to the third and last part of my talk, which is really the other activity that we are, uh, we've started about a year ago in the team, uh, looking at the cell type comparisons and integration across the different species. And uh, I, I will give you an idea of uh, what we're doing and where we are in this endeavor. So just to start, so ever since 
basically the last century. So human, so biologists have been observing the function of cells, both in human and other species, to understand the behavior of cells in health and disease. And here there are some. Uh, I'm showing some popular model organisms and their divergence time from human. And as we can see, even morphologically, our organs and cells look similar from um, uh, with uh, species such as macaque um, and mouse or pig. Uh, but we have millions of years, millions of years apart in evolution. Uh, so basically, the idea here is that as computational biologists, we can try to understand the similarities and differences of cell types between species at the molecular level, uh, both in kind of close uh, related species, but also in divergent species. And uh, also, recent in recent um, in recent years through the efforts of uh, multiple consortia, um, there, is, um, there is an increasing availability of multi-organ single cell atlases from various model species and human, and they are publicly available, uh, so they can be uh, leveraged. So these uh, cell atlases are annotated by tissue experts already, and uh, they have been pre-analyzed, so we can potentially use them to look into the differences in gene expression of cell types across the different um, evolutionary uh, distances. So, um, so what would be the approach to perform such a comparison in such heterogeneous data? And uh, here the answer usually is data integration and transcriptomic data is compositional data, which means um, only the relative level is informative and not the absolute level. So data integration aims really to correct for these uh, global differences acro acro across data sets, uh, but uh, really maintain the relative difference within each data set. And here I'll show you what I mean uh, by the example. So on the left here, well, here we have um, a two data sets from the same tissue. One is from human and one is from a uh, mouse. And we uh, put them in uh, the same um, human space, but they are unintegrated, so not corrected. Um, and if we color them by species, uh, we see the mouse uh, cells here, the human cells here. If we color them by uh, cell type, we see, for example, the mouse uh, B cell here, and the human B cell there. Um, and there is kind of uh, this a big species effect uh, and that needs to be addressed in order really to be able to compare transcriptomically um, the B cells between mouse and human. Um, so once we correct for the species effect, so if we see on the right, this is uh, integrated where we have corrected. Um, the similar cell types uh, kind of fit in together, and we see a mixing uh, of the different species. So really the aim of uh, our project, uh, the first part of our project, is to find the best integration strategy because they don't always work at all different species, and examine the output characteristics of different um, uh, cross species integration strategies. So basically, the different elements that we try to investigate is uh, how we match genes across species using gene homology. Uh, also, um, be able to choose uh, which integration algorithms and how they perform. And also, we tested how, um, how uh, at the end, how the uh, cell type annotation transfer performs across species after integ integration. Um, and we tested these uh, kind of three questions on a variety of biological systems for the different integration goals. And the idea is that we, we developed at the end a how-to guide for performing cross-species integration of single-cell RNA-seq uh, RNA data. So um, again, here we developed a pipeline. So the uh, overall, the, I can say the integration across species is computationally challenging. And it was unclear from the beginning how to map homologous genes and which integration algorithm would achieve our goals. So we assembled this next flow pipeline called uh, Bengal, which is uh, publicly available. And 
from the GitHub um, link at the bottom. Um, and um, and we consider as the key goals of the cross-species in integration three aspects. So uh, how well the species are mixed, um, how well the biology is conserved, and whether we can do an effective um, uh, uh, annotation uh, transfer. And here, uh, in addition to using established um, benchmarking metrics, I would like to highlight a new metric that we have developed to target the most um, unwanted behavior in this cross-species integration. And this is called uh, ALCS, it's accuracy loss of uh, cell type self-projection. Um, so it's uh, this one uh, that we investigate and we test basically um, the accuracy that we lose after uh, integration uh, in order to see how well the biology has been conserved. Um, and and, and uh, basically, um, this is important because we lead to misinterpretation of cell type homology inferred from the integration. And we use the accuracy decrease of the self projector uh, projection of the multinomial logistic classifier to address the loss of uh, cell type distinguishability after the integration. So, um, so you can actually read more about that on our preprint, um, how we developed it and how it can be used in other contexts, for example. Um, so um, finally, we applied this pipeline that we call Benga to a variety of different biological scenarios that cover uh, eight different species um, that kind of vary in uh, evolutionary uh, distance. And uh, also we performed uh, 16 different benchmarking tasks. And these include looking at adult tissues, so such as pancreas, hippocampus, and heart. Um, uh, embryonic uh, development. Uh, we had one task uh, comparing whole embryos. Um, species with uh, increasing phylogenetic distance. So this was nine tasks where we kind of added uh, an, a each time a species that was um, further away in evolutionary uh, terms. And uh, then we also tested the scenario of having a uh, multiple species in one integration, not just two, but three, four, and and so on, and how, how well does it work? Um, so generally we have, um, doing all these uh, kind of benchmarking tasks, we were able to provide recommendations for integration strategies depending on the data set, uh, the species that are involved, um, and also the goal of the integration. So is the goal of the integration to look at a whole body um, in an embryonic setting, or is it really to uh, be able to transfer annotation um, across the different species and so on? Um, so uh, basically, uh, yeah, we, uh, you can, uh, I will uh, just mention the general conclusions of this in the next slide, but you can read a lot more about the discussions and the considerations from our preprint. So basically in conclusion, um, we found, um, so we, we found that uh, most tools work very, work quite well when the species are closely related, uh, but uh, not so well in kind of distant uh, evolutionary um, species. Um, so for integration of whole body atlases or uh, when we have a low quality of gene homology annotation, when, when the two different species homologs are, are not really, um, um, are not a good quality, we found a tool called SumUp, which is actually the uh, one of the few tools that are built specifically for cross-species integration to resolve this uh, gene homology mapping challenge because they do their own, the tool does its own um, 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 comparison of the sequences. So um, for uh, species that share a large amount of one-to-many and many-to-many -many orthologs, uh, including these orthologs can actually uh, improve the um, integration. And we found this to be the case, especially when um, comparing 
mammals with uh, known ma uh, mammals uh, that are uh, much more distant. And it also, it also point, points to some interesting questions on uh, how we think um, of uh, gene homology in a functional way uh, when, because um, at the moment we're really comparing hom homologs based on the, um, on, on the, on the, sequ on the DNA sequence similarity, but uh, actually um, there are some indications that in distant species maybe paralogs are actually functional, functionally in expression um, uh, in, from the expression aspect are more related um, than um, orthologs. So uh, anyway, this um, basically, uh, yeah, what, what we found is that um, generally cross-species integration of single cell RNA-seq data is still very uh, challenging for the current algorithms. And there's actually a good space for someone to be involved in, in developing uh, better algorithms for cross-species integration. Uh, now that more data sets are increasingly being produced uh, across uh, different uh, species. Um, yeah, so, so basically, just to summarize, so, um, so yeah, so I described, uh, just to bring everything together at the end, I, I described the two different resources that my team built, the Expression Atlas and the Single Cell Expression Atlas. Um, and also I described uh, the assays we're doing uh, on cell type composition of bulk data and how this could be applied to study um, a disease. Um, from large cohorts of bulk data where there's lots of availability of data. And also I described how we are using integration techniques to, to study um, cross species uh, integration of uh, uh, cell type data, um, we, which is uh, kind of an emerging uh, field. Um, Finally, I would like to, um, to acknowledge uh, my team. So first, the um, Expression Atlas team. So this is the group of curators, bioinformaticians, and software engineers that are behind the um, Expression Atlas and the Single Cell Expression Atlas. And then um, my research group, and especially uh, the cross-species um, work was, uh, is being done by Yu Yao Song, uh, my PhD student. And the cell type deconvolution is led by Anna Vathrakokili Purnara, who is my other PhD student, and all with uh, big contributions from uh, Nadia Nolte. Um, and uh, finally, I would, I'm really grateful to our collaborators uh, for all the inspiring discussions and help with data and uh, understanding, and our funders, of course. Um, and if you want to follow up any uh, developments on the Expression Atlas, please feel free to follow us on Twitter and uh, also this gene expression at ebi.ac.uk. Uh, you can send any uh, queries or feedback and so on about the resource. So I would be, you would be welcome. Thank you. Very complete uh, talk uh, with all the the things that you are doing uh, on the on the single cells. Um, so maybe I can start with um, a question from the remote audience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is from Claudia. She's thanking you for the nice talk and asking which criteria do the RNA-seq data need to fulfill to be represented in the expression atlas. Okay, so um, so yes, there are some certain criteria. Uh, they are outlined on our FAQ page uh, on the website. So it's different for bulk or single cell RNA-seq. Bulk in general, we need at least three replicates and uh, the minimum uh, metadata that are really um, outlined. So I, I would say it's, uh, um, Anyone can look at the website, and if in doubt, they can also send us an email to the help desk, where the curators so will discuss very happy. this on a case by case yeah. basis. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so there are several questions. Maybe we can start here. 
Hi, uh, so thank you very much for the very interesting talk. So um, I had a question about the deconvolution part. And uh, if you could just elaborate a little bit more about the influence of the signature on the on the results of the predictions for the cell types. Because uh, in my little experience with the convolution is that it, it changes a lot the, the estimated proportions. So you said in, that you did benchmarking about the methods, but what about the signatures? Yeah, so they are very important. Um, so by signatures, you mean the reference that you use. Yeah, uh, so these are really important. And in many cases, we would have to try different references to look at the coverage. Uh, do they cover all the cell types? Because if they don't, then you, you cannot resolve this. And what the algorithm is going to do is uh, try and find the closest um, available reference and try and map um, those signals there. Um, so that is very important. In some instances, like now we're trying to do this for melanoma, we actually got a few different single cell data sets and are integrate, trying to integrate in them to cover all the cell types. So I, this is a really important task. And what we do in the pipeline, we have some functions that can help you evaluate if uh, your reference is good by building pseudo bulk uh, from that. Um, I mean, it's not the best way to do it, but it's really, at least you can see if, and, and then use another reference on pseudo bulk, uh, different one, single cell to be able and compare um, and decide if that indeed is a good reference uh, across the different tools. Thank you. There were other questions? Okay, so let's go here first. Uh, thank you again for a great talk. I'm actually working on a very similar project with the cross-species analysis, specifically in sarcoma. And selfishly, I'm asking if uh, the uh, benchmarking data sets that you mentioned with the different tasks are publicly available um, or? Yeah, they are. So um, they're available. If you go to the GitHub page, um, they are there as well. Uh, as the methods, so you can see the data there as well. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe we can take a question from one study. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. So what we learned from Bulk in the past is that uh, comparing gene expression between species can be tricky because even if a gene is highly expressed, it doesn't mean it plays the same role in both species. And then what we noticed is that comparing actually pathways between species is something that is better informative. Uh, is this something that you're planning to include? Yes, so you're right. We, I didn't talk about this because it's very preliminary. So we found uh, actually uh, comparing on the pathways per cell type um, across distant species that it's, it, it, it seems to be working uh, much better. Uh, but we're running, we're still running it on more uh, species to be um, kind of to gain certainty, but we certainly find that uh, in the in the single cell data, and we are moving along this way. Um, I think the only problem there is that you know that our knowledge of pathways is biased uh, because you know the pathways have been curated, and um, you know there's no kind of it would be better if there was an unbiased way of uh, classifying the genes and doing the comparison uh, rather than um, uh, the pathways from, say, reactome that are kind of selected a uh, few and curated by the community. So uh, so I think, yeah, I, it is worth investigating and we're doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so go there, go back to you. <laughs> Trying to reach the uh, all corners of the room. Hi, Tene. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering if you are planning to add more transcriptomic data, such as special or so on. Um, in the single cell expression atlas? Yeah, like yeah. instead of single cell, kind of a special atlas. Yeah, so so we are uh, we do have plans to expand the single cell expression 
should not allow us to include spatial transcriptomics data. Uh, I think uh, one of the uh, major hurdles at the moment is the standardized uh, kind of metadata associated with this. So we, we are, we're kind of at an earlier stage than we are with the single cell RNA-seq before we kind of um, can establish uh, standardization in order to put them in the resource. But yeah, it's one of the uh, future um, kind of aims for us. Okay, now. Thank you. I was just wondering about the complementarity between decovolution and multi species integration. Uh, I was wondering if you tested the decovolution across species. Uh, because, you know, the signature matrix basically represents the tissue better than any sample. And if you try to cluster cells across species, maybe the signature is, is a good lead to take. So that's something we haven't tried, but I know, um, I know uh, of one community where they are looking at the species where the, there aren't any single cell data for that species yet. Uh, that they tried, um, um, that they, they had a similar idea to do deconvolution using a single cell reference of uh, another model organism um, for that species. But um, I'm not sure of the, we, it's something we, we haven't looked into it, but it, it might be a solution for um, kind of species that uh, where there are bulk data, but not single cell data. Uh, first of all, and thank you for your talk. Uh, I have uh, two, let's say, naive questions regarding deconvolution. Uh, first is, uh, how is our results of deconvolution dependent on number and proportion of cells that we use as a reference data? And the second part, uh, if we are trying to integrate data to use the reference, how and do we deal with uh, batch effects uh, in, the <clears throat> Sorry, in the reference data? Okay, so uh, so for your first question uh, is um, if if the proportion of cell types in the reference affects uh, the deconvolution, right? So uh, so yeah, so we looked at this and we found that generally the proportion doesn't affect so much as um, you know missing cell types. So if you if you have zero cell type in the reference of a particular zero cells of a particular cell type in their reference um, then uh, this kind of uh, it doesn't it doesn't help um, so and your second question was whether batch effects uh, in uh, the references affect um, so yes um, so the so we uh, we did an assay on that, um, and uh, using the, uh, kind of the the cross sample that I saw that I showed before, basically checked that and what kind of normalization techniques we need to use. And yes, they do play a role, and it's something that you need to be careful uh, of. And we have like some uh, functions on the pipeline where you can run some tests. Uh, using the pseudo bulk and um, uh, you know the uh, reference deconvolution, uh, where you you know already the proportions of cell types to investigate. I think we can have one more. Question. So first, uh, thanks a lot for the these uh, independent benchmarks. I think that's really needed in the community, and we are missing. Uh, uh, this type of effort. So <laughs> thanks for publishing this. I guess we all do that in our corners and not always publish that. So, um, I had a question about the cross species. I really see the value to find what is conserved across species, but most of the evolutionary biologists are interested in uh, innovations. And because the species is by itself uh, com confounded with a batch, because these are generated in different labs and uh, uh, I mean, different systems. These are totally different systems. I mean, how? What are your your thoughts about? You know, when something differs in one species, is it, is it something technical or is it a true biological uh, signal? Yeah. So that that is a that, that is a good question. Um, so unfortunately, um, at, so at the moment we cannot easily differentiate between the species effect and the batch effect within a species because the. For most of the species, we don't have 
uh, you know, atlases coming from the same kind of organs coming from different labs? I think that that's a question we could start addressing uh, later. Uh, once, I mean, now for FLY, for example, uh, there are more uh, data sets coming up from different labs. Um, we don't um, have them for many other species, but I think it's something we can start looking into. Okay. If it's quick, you have a quick question? Okay. Uh, you mentioned using network analysis uh, in getting cell-specific information from bulk RNA-seq. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So, um, so basically, with our collaborator, Evangelia Petsalaki, that I described in the liver fibrosis um, uh, example. So uh, the idea that what we're trying to do is uh, use cell type deconvolution to get expression uh, profiles and proportions of uh, predicted of uh, different bulk samples per cell type. And then uh, her lab develops uh, network uh, techniques that could um, identify uh, the, the pathways um, that are involved in these um, cell types that we have got from deconvolution. Um, and and we, are can, we are collaboratively working at the moment on refining these techniques and see if we can uh, add extra value. <laughs> 